today, I'm not, I'm not giving a speech, I want to give a lecture. And I want, because I, I want it to be an educational experience, and I, I want to have a lot of feedback and there's some exchange from you as well. Um, one thing I want to make clear is that we do not uh, hold any animosity towards those grassroots, our fellow citizens that are involved in this movement. Uh, we believe that they're uninformed and misinformed, but we believe that they're doing this out of a patriotic duty, a sense of a patriotic duty. So, but on the other hand, those that have initiated this, and it's been going on for 50 years, and that have maintained this, the promoters, the top folks, we believe they do have a bad motive. So, the, the one question that you need to ask yourself on this issue is, do you think that changing the Constitution is going to get our, our government servants to obey the Constitution after they've been violating it for over 100 years? That's the only question that you have to ask and answer yourself. Uh, there's lots of issues that these guys want to talk about because they're trying to divert your attention from what the real issue is. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, I want to get into first to talk about actually the Article 5 convention itself, and it is an amendments convention. Um, and there, there are two different processes that, that, you, that, that you go through. There is the actual amendment proposal process, and then there's the ratification process. The uh, amendment proposal process has two different phases of it, options. One of them is that the Congress can initiate and make proposals itself, and the other one is that the states can apply to have Congress call a national convention, and then the convention will uh, propose the amendments. Uh, and then each of those ways can be uh, ratified at the direction of Congress, either through a, the, the legislature of the states possessive, and or it can be ratified by conventions in the states. So the process really looks something like this. Where you have Congress that initiates it, and then you have state legislators or conventions. in the states. And this is the convention way. And again, sex to legislature or convention. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about Constitutional Convention versus an Amendments Convention. Now, the, the Convention of States folks, people are promoting this, don't like this to be called CONCON. -con. Uh, and technically, it's not a CONCON. -con. They're trying to get an article, uh, an amendment, or Amendments Convention going. But we're going to see later that really doesn't matter. Um, the authority, and let me explain this, the, con the Constitutional Convention basically is a process where representatives are called together uh, and they write a constitution. So if they can write a constitution for the first time or maybe they're writing a new constitution. Uh, and that's basically how we ended up with our current constitution. The Continental Congress called an amendments convention and before it was over, that convention was converted to a constitutional convention, and they simply rewrote a new constitution. So that's how we got our current constitution. The authority for the constitutional convention uh, is the authority, the inherent authority of the people uh, that is referred to in the Declaration of Independence. And it says, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, and they're talking about to secure our rights, 
Uh, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. That's the, the, the authority that they're talking about. It's an inerrant authority. It's not from the Declaration. The Declaration simply mentions it. So if you're talking about an alteration, you're talking about an Article 5 convention, right? But if you're talking about a new constitution, then you're talking about a constitutional convention. And as I said, the con con is to write a complete constitution or a new constitution. The Article 5 is to amend an existing constitution. But it's a distinction without a difference. Because an amendment can be the change of one comma in that constitution, or it can be the change of everything but one comma. So it, it's a distinction without a difference. It doesn't really matter. The other thing that we have to understand is that it takes, I mean, people aren't really concerned about the fact that somebody may alter the Constitution per se. That's not their concern, right? That's not you folks' concern. Your concern is that the government is going to be altered in some harmful way. That's really everybody's concern, right? You can drastically change our government with six little words. You can say the states are no longer sovereign. That's all it takes. What that does, it destroys federalism and it destroys the protection of our liberties that we have under allegiance and protection. Uh, now, federalism, I want to, I want to uh, try to get you to understand um, what that is or how it operates in our system. Uh, a lot of people want to refer to the government in Washington, D.C. as the federal government. It is not the federal government. That is the central government or the general government. That's what the founders called it, all right? And it's a component. It's a component of the federal government. So here's the central government here. And then you have the states. And then you have the people. This is the federal government. Does everybody understand that? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what we have is what I call the protection of federalism or the promise of federalism. You have a natural tension between these groups to maintain the balance inside this federal government, okay? Um, you have, for instance, the states were and are sovereign. So under sovereignty, they had a duty of allegiance and protection to the people. Does anybody know what allegiance or protection is? Do you know what it is? What is it? They're, they're obligated to protect us. That's right. We formed we formed the state to represent us and protect our territory and our land. That's and it comes back to land. That's that's pretty close. Absolutely. <clears throat> Allegiance and protection. It's thousands of years old. It's a it's an ancient inherent principle of sovereignty. And what it does, it describes the mutual obligations between a sovereign and its citizens. Now, because the United States is so unique in that we are the sovereign, there's a little bit of a twist to it. But that's basically what it is. So, in exchange for your allegiance, your loyalty and fidelity, and that means, unfortunately, for some people, I guess, you have to pay taxes, right? You have to uh, be able to serve in the military. You have to be willing and able to serve in the militia. You have to be able to answer the call of the posse comitatus. All these things that you have to do as a citizen, and then the sovereign is obligated to protect your, your rights. And again, and this is another principle that's expressed uh, in the Declaration of Independence. They are supposed to protect our rights. They do not protect us. Does, ever, does, it, does everybody understand the difference between that? It's a very subtle difference, but it makes an enormous uh, ramification of what they're doing. For instance, the NSA now is 
infringing upon our liberties and our freedom uh, of privacy, etc., to protect us. Hmm. They're not protecting our rights, they're protecting us. And in fact, you have to limit somebody's rights to protect them, right? No matter what, like the president. The president can't go anywhere he wants because he's being protected. So he is, his rights have to be restricted. Well, just like your general welfare clause, it's not to take care of everybody with welfare. It's absolutely right. It is. It's part of protecting our rights. To, you know, whatever we do to protect our rights. Okay. So this this remained in place. So what that means is, if the central government starts infringing on the citizens, the states have an absolute duty to, you, you know, duty is something that you must do, right? And authority or a right is something that you may do. The states have an absolute duty to interpose, to stop whatever entity is trying to infringe upon your rights, okay? That's, that's one of the main points of the sovereignty issue. Now, they also have the officers of both the central government and the states under the Constitution have to take an oath to protect the Constitution, right? So from that standpoint, uh, the state officials are also officers of the federal government, okay? They're not officers of the central government, they're officers of the federal government, and their responsibility is to protect the federal government, right? To maintain, to maintain the balance in the system. That's part of what they do. So if the uh, central government is getting out of hand, it's the state's responsibility, or at least their officers, which is you know, basically the same because they have to be officers, to maintain that balance, to push back. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the central government, if the states start infringing in this area, then it pushes back. Now, the system that was set up, it, it would look something like this. That didn't come off for a minute. I was wondering about that. Who gave you the first clue? <laughs> CG, this is the central government. These are the states. And then we have. We have the people, all right? These are supposed to be staying in balance. If they get out of balance, then the way the planners or their founders planned it was the people would go wherever they needed to go. Either they would they would join in with the Fed, with the central government or the states as appropriate to rebalance the situation, okay? Um, and they had some pretty, the states had some pretty good uh, equipment to do that. That's the whole purpose behind the militia, which we no longer have, right? The federal government and the states colluded together in the early 1900s to do away with our militia. And so what we have now, the National Guard is a, an Article I standing army. Does everybody understand that? It's not the militia. So that's gone. questions on that. I want to start getting into some of the substance then of, of the problem with this Article 5, but I want to make sure that everybody has a good understanding of federalism and, and how that operates and all that. Do we have any questions? It's, it's, you know, that's really interesting how we focus on, we call Washington the federal government. Even this morning I said that I don't, I, uh, 
have less questions about paying taxes to the state of South Dakota or local government, I can see the roads are being paved and so forth. So I see s some things that are uh, positive, but I don't see anything at all. And so, you know, historically, I think we, as a nation, if you ask that question to most people on the street, they would say that, yeah, the federal government and the central government are one and the same. We're the states, and we don't want anything to do with the federal government. And yet, what you're saying here is very interesting to me that, you know, you said our legislators in the state level are federal officers. And I never, never really thought of that before. And they are. The job is to protect the federal government. Mm -hmm. And to maintain that balance, that's part of what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, most people don't. I mean, so if there was ever an insurrection against the central government, uh, then we're, we uh, have our, our states are really violating their oath of office? Well, you, you, you kind of have to be careful, though, in terms of an insurrection. Um, you, you can't really have a rebellion or insurrection against an, an entity. That's against the sovereign. Who's the sovereign? The people. So unless you're, you're going against the will of the people in the Constitution, you're not, you know, in fact, what I would but say you, is... You, you talk about the balance. It's so far out. The central government is so far out of balance. Your line there should be much longer because the balance is gone. And what, you know, what, what recourse do we have against uh, the tyranny that exists in Washington? Yeah, that's what we're going to get into that. Because you know, I think we have some solutions on that. But uh, I want to make you understand, yes, sir. I was wondering, um, as, as a sovereign people, as we are all our people, uh, how do they get the jurisdiction over us? I don't, I can't see it anywhere. I can't read it anywhere. But yet, everybody believes it that they have the jurisdiction over us. Who's, who's they? Everybody. No, no. I mean, you're talking about the, the federal government? government. Yeah, yeah, the government. Through the Constitution. The, the way it was set up under the Articles of uh, Confederation, the federal government had no jurisdiction over the people. It couldn't do anything to make the people do anything. It had no power over them. It could only act on the states. Well, the states were the boss. They were the real sovereign. See, I mean, the definition of sovereign is an entity that, that is self-contained and, and emanates its own authority. It operates on its own, right? Like, like a car has its own engine. It's not pulled by a horse. It's, it's self-contained, right? Well, so the states have that. They are sovereign because they have the ability to regulate themselves internally and make their own decisions. And of course, we are the, are the ultimate sovereigns under God, right? But the federal government is, and you've heard this, it's a, a government of enumerated powers, right? It, it doesn't emanate its own authority. It's not a true sovereign. That's another misconception that, that, that even the courts want to talk about. I mean, part of the problem that we have is we don't pay attention to words, and words mean something, and we let people misuse and abuse words, like federal government, you know, because there's a heck of a difference between the federal government and the central government, and people get confused with that. Okay, is there anything else in? Okay, now, and this is kind of going to get back to what we just discussed. We want to find out, they, they say that the problem, the real problem in the Republic is that the servants of the central government are not following the Constitution, and that's the problem. So they're going to, they're going to amend the Constitution and change it. <clears throat> to find out if that's the real problem, one way to do it is to ask the question, why do our federal servants not obey the Constitution? And if you can answer that question, if there's an answer to it, then that is not truly the root problem. Does anybody want to tell me what the, if they think there's a root problem? Why does it, why do our federal servants not follow, or our central servants not follow the Constitution? They're not forced to. Bingo because they're not forced to. Congress is not doing their job, the judicial is not doing their job, and when 
when you appoint your attorney general, <laughs> it's kind of a no-brainer. Right. Yeah. But it's deeper than well, that. The, the people, people are doing their job. Yeah, the people. That's right. No, now it's mostly starting with money. Well, that's certainly a corrupting influence. Um, well, let's look at it from another perspective. And, and if you disagree with any of these statements, just let me know. And I don't want you to worry about the angry jeers of your neighbors or any sharp sticks that may, that may point to them. Uh, but our, our society, our government, is based on Judeo-Christian principles. Does anybody disagree with that? I don't care if you believe in God or not. It doesn't have anything to do with that. They are based, it is based on Judeo-Christian principles. Whether you believe in God or not. I do believe in God, but it doesn't matter. That's the principle. One of those principles is, is self-responsibility, right? You don't slough off your obligations on somebody else. You don't expect somebody else to do your obligations. You have certain duties and responsibilities, and it's your job to take care of them. That's it. That's the moral perspective of it, right? Um, so the question then is, who's the boss in this country? Is the boss, and in, in law, what we say, we call a master-servant relationship, all right? So who's the master? Is, is the president the master in this country? It's supposed to be the people. He thinks he is. The people. And then who's, who's the servant? The government. The, the government. government. The, the government. government. The government. The All the governments, right? And so whose job is it to make the servant do what they're supposed to do? If the servant disobeys and doesn't do their job, whose fault is it ultimately? The people. It's the people. It's the master. I know the master. And we're not accepting our responsibility, right? See, what these guys want to tell you is, you know, they're, cha they're snake charmers, right? Uh, what they're trying to tell you is, you guys, this isn't your fault, right? This is, a this is the fault of a bunch of lying politicians in Washington, you know, right? And there are a bunch of lying politicians in Washington, so it's easy to believe that. But that's not, you know, and they say, don't worry about it. You don't have to take care of it. We have a solution. We're going to do a convention, right? We'll take care of the problem for you. You don't even have to worry about it. So in other words, what they're saying is, our problem, we know, right, we all agree, the problem is because we're not doing our job keeping the, the government in line, right? We're, we're failing in our patriotic, and if you believe that this, God, that this republic was established in part by God's help, which I believe, and the founders believe, we have a moral duty. It's even higher. We have a moral duty, right? Uh, and but they're going to tell you, you know, that you don't have a responsibility to take care of it, all right? We're going to keep on doing the same thing. What happens if you keep doing the same thing? You're going to get the same thing. See, if we don't, and that's what they're doing. They're, they're trying to log you into this sense of, of security so you can get on that. Because let me tell you something, I, I promise you this. This is going to be dirty work, and it's going to be hard work, and it's not going to be fun work. It's not. You might end up driving around South Dakota <laughs> on a circle, right? You know, it's a funny thing. When I first started on this, I was trying to get a senator that was a state senator that um, was just horrendous in the stuff that he would do. And, you know, I actually tried to talk to him at one point, and he says, you know, you're not even from my district. I don't, I'm not even going to talk to you, oh. right? So what I started doing is I'd get anywhere from maybe three to ten people, and I'd start going to his district for anywhere from a day to three days, and we'd pick it outside of his office, and then we'd go downtown and hand out literature about how bad he voted, right? And people would say, Richard, what are you doing, man? You're, you're driving 200 miles to the other side of the state. It's not even your district. But what he does affects me. The fight is where the fight is, and you've got to go to it. So it doesn't matter what district you're in, it doesn't matter what state you're in. You know, I don't care why the ship goes down. My job is to get there and to stop it from going down. Now, an analogy that I use uh, in this, just so people, it's easier for people to understand. The Constitution is like maybe a no trespassing sign, right? That's really what it is. We don't get any rights from the Constitution. I hate it when people say constitutional rights. There aren't any constitutional rights. It, it gives us nothing. We have unalienable, God-given rights, right? And the Founders said, you know, when you start stop believing in God, and this is from God, and you lose it, because then who are they from? They're, they're from the biggest monkey in the jungle, 
So we, we, you know, I believe in that. So that's that's what we hold to. Um, so, but what what the Constitution is is like a no trespassing sign. Yeah. Well, I think most of us sitting here today would concur with the fact that we're almost to the point our government is, and we the people then drop the ball. I guess uh, that. Can we stop the ship from going down? Do you feel that there is hope? We could stop it in less than a month. In less than a month? Absolutely. Will we? I don't think I don't think we will. Let's see. I don't think we will. I don't know how many stops we've made already. You, see, there, there are, you, you say and I say amen to that you know that it's based on Judeo Christian principles mm -hmm. of responsibility, but um, the liberal element in our country is just growing and and because the easy way out is you owe me. And we're now approaching, you know, that's where they, the politicians buy off and get votes. And I, I just, uh, until uh, the dollar is destroyed and so forth, Finally, when hard times hit so hard, there's no other solution and no longer can they go out and ask the government to bail them out, then I think there's hope. But why do they do that? Why, why is Kansas implementing Common Core when nobody in Kansas wants Common Core? Why did the central government implement Obamacare when 80% of the people didn't want Obamacare? Why did they do that? Control. Why did they did for control, but why were they able to do it? Because, because who did anything? anything? Yeah. Yeah. Who did anything? But the problem here with your scenario is that the people uh, do, they like that there's more and more of them that want that handout and think if the party will go on forever. Well, I uh, think that, they, I don't they, mean they, 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 Experts for, for centuries have, have said that if you get to the point that you get more people that are taking the dole than are, then it's lost. And I, I believe that's true. And I think we're close, but we're not there. But we've been sitting on our tail end, not stopping it. it it's our fault because that's happening. Sign of the majority? Yeah, whatever you want to call them. Because we're not doing anything, right? Well, well, and why are the people voting for the same people in office when we have people that will follow the Constitution, but they just get behind somebody even though they're breaking their oath of office and put them in office over and over and well, over? Well, because we don't, never one, we don't. That they're ignorant. We don't know people. But where do these where do these politicians come from uh, that we elect? They come from us. They're a reflection of our own ignorance. They they just are. I hear this nonsense all the time. I hear I hear our governor say, "Oh, federal mandates, federal mandates." Mm. There aren't federal mandates. There aren't federal mandates. Under this principle, the central government may not make a state pass legislation. They can't tell a state, you have to have a, drive, a speed limit of 55. They can't do it. Sure. Not allowed. They cannot make a state participate in or administrate a federal program. They cannot, which means they cannot make the state's uh, officers do background checks for farmers. They can't make them do it. So why do we have seatbelt laws in Kansas and helmet laws in Kansas yeah. Huh? Because the federal government offered Kansas money. I think the seatbelt was fifty million dollars. If they would pass, right? Now, right? It's bribery. Yeah. And what's even worse is the federal government doesn't have the authority to be involved in education, right? It just doesn't have the authority. Therefore, the state governments do not have the authority to accept that money. And in fact, they should put a stop to the federal government offering it because as federal officers, they're allowing a central government to take this out of balance, right? Mm -hmm. But whose fault is it? It's our fault, right? So if you go up there and say, oh, well, I want, I want my welfare and I want this and I want that and I want, no, 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 no. We're doing it to ourselves. Then you come to come talk about this and you get uh, 15 people show up. Yeah. Instead of yeah. 15 yeah, this could be this could be changed in a month if people would stand up and say yeah, we, we will not allow it. 
We will not stand for this. If you go to the state house and stand in their office and don't let them out, you pack the state house, what are they going to do? They're afraid of us. Believe me, they're, they're putting the central government's got about two billion rounds of ammunition they hoarded over the last about five, six years, all right? They don't, they, they don't let the military sell brass uh, to cartridge companies anymore. They shred it and get, get you know, pennies on a, a shell, they get fractions of a penny on a shell, right? What do you think they do that? Because so, from being on we, can, we can change it, but the issue is will we change it? And there will be a point where it will not be possible to change. It will get to that point. Well, also in South Dakota, there's people, the legislators are not passing some of these laws. The bureaucrats are because like on SBIR.gov, there was 129 different grants that the state of South Dakota got written out by different entities to give us GMOs, to give us, then they had some implementation into the colleges. And, and who, where are they getting the money? They're getting it from... Um, it comes from the central government. Federal government. Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of it's through the Farm Bill and the yeah. FDA, yeah. and it goes to the colleges to do research, so then the college gets all this money to do the research, yeah. and so they're doing the research that the federal government or the central government wants them to do. Right. And, and the states, the money. here's the way to handle it. You go up there and you grab them by their tie and you say, you pass legislation that absolutely forbids any agencies from applying and accepting federal money. If the federal money comes, it comes through us. See, that's the other thing that's going on. And they, they're, it, this is part of the sustainable development stuff. They're setting up these regional governances and then the feds are funneling money to the local governments and the counties, and they're turning over their sovereignty to the federal government, right? Yeah. Uh, because of the strings attached, where the federal government wouldn't have authority anyway. And I've seen that. It's happening in Kansas. It's happening everywhere, right? And like our good Governor uh, Brownback, who's supposed to be a good conservative, he's the number one promoter of sustainable development of any officer in that state. But that's how you stop that nonsense. You pass, you make them pass legislation that the states, the counties, and the agencies may not accept that federal money. But see, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. They want the money, right? They want the money. Free money. Free money, federal dollars, right? You have to be somewhere by what time? Two thirty. Don't you guys know city? Yeah. And the guy out the. The desk out there, and he wants to tell his dad about it. So somebody needs to tell him the time and place in Hill City. But 2 30 in Hill City. I'm just warning you guys, oh, too many questions. This guy's going to be late to the next. Yeah. Well, <laughs> be right. the city tonight, too. All, All right. right. This schedule doesn't have the Richard, I wanted to bring up a song here. Okay. Um, that's, that's the state of South Dakota. The <laughs> session is in progress right now, but most people have no idea that the, federal, the state of South Dakota's budget is now half federal spending. That's so Kansas. And we're number four on the list in the nation, by the way. And that's, uh, that's something that isn't talked about. But it goes to the very thing that- it, It's unacceptable. About. What's that? It's unacceptable. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely unacceptable. But just five years ago, we were taking 36 cents out of every dollar per, from the federal government. Now it's off almost and, in and just you know, five years. Do you know what that represents? I think it's more than that. It, it represents the sale of your liberty. That's what they're doing. Yes. We had a, we had a, I had a fellow patriot when Brownback took this money from this $31.5 million to implement Obamacare that he said was unconstitutional, right? That he's going to have money to implement it. We had a patriot that figured that out. And he valued our liberty at like $10.23 a person in Kansas. That's what our liberty meant to him, right? Why do you want a bum like that in office? Yeah. He's, 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 you know, he's serving the interests of business and the, and the central, you know, the people that are flagging the central government. Sounds like everybody that's in office here. Well, we're sending our chief crook in charge of the state of South Dakota to D.C. so he can fit right in with those guys. Yeah, and so we got to stop. Browns. All right, I want to go, I want to talk, I want to talk, how much time do we have? No, probably one forty-five. you better be on the road. What time, how much time do we have? Over here. It's uh, I want to talk about the history of this movement because it's very interesting. Um, the, this movement actually started in the 1950s by the Ford Foundation. Okay? 
the Ford Foundation paid a, a NGO, a non-governmental organization, called the Fund for the Republic, $16.5 million. The Fund for the Republic uh, set up an organization called the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. Uh, and it gave, uh, the Ford Foundation gave them $25 million. And their charge was to rewrite the Constitution. That's what they were supposed to do. So, and they went out and they got a gentleman by the name of Rex Tugwell. Is anybody familiar with Rex Tugwell? Rex Tugwell was the head of FDR's brain trust for the New Deal, right? So he helped develop the legislation and implement that legislation. Uh, so what it tells you, he's got experience in, in doing legislation whose that's purpose is to change our government and our society, because that's what the New Deal was. He was a supporter of regional governance. Before he went to work for uh, Roosevelt, he spent a few years in Russia, and he, he thought they had a wonderful system there. And see, that's what they do. They have regional government. They call them Soviets, right? So you have a local Soviet, and then you have all these other little Soviets, and they go up, and, and it's so that they can funnel the central planning from above down, right? So if you guys have, just like in Kansas, we have the Mid-American Regional Commission. That's really a Mid-American Regional Soviet. That's what it is. And it's to take the authority and power away from you guys. Because there may be people uh, that are elected that sit in that commission, but none of them are elected to the commission. And I've seen them do this time and time again. Governor Rounds is in Section 8. He's been assigned. Is that the, 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 the Obama's Committee of Governors? Yes. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I, and I think it's a, a violation of the Constitution, Article 4. Um, he was a member of the Committee to Frame a World Constitution. The Constitution that he had set up, that he drafted, abolished, or proposed to abolish the states and set up the federal regions in their place. Um, <clears throat> they finished their work in 70, I think 72, 73, and it was published with this new state's uh, constitution, what they called it. Nelson Rockefeller, who was president of the Senate, was starting to push for an open convention, right? Um, and he did it in part because of the balanced budget. They've always used the balanced budget for some reason. Now, I suspect it's because Americans uh, are too connected to money, is probably the reason. Um, but anyway, so he was a good friend of Tugwell's, and he was out promoting the Tugwell Constitution. Also, at that time, 1973, and this, will, this is relevant later, an organization called the American Legislative Exchange Council was formed. In the mid-1980s, they started pushing for a limited Article 5 convention. Again, they were pushing the balanced budget. <clears throat> at that time, uh, some of these guys approached the, re the retired Chief Justice Warren Burger, and he retired to be the chairman of the Bicentennial Constitution Committee. So, you know, they were trying to do this as a, as a patriotic thing. <clears throat> but he was having an exchange, email letter exchange, with Phyllis Shafley during that period of time that they're promoting this Article 5. And she said, you know, can it be controlled? He said, no, you can't control that. Because they're, you know, they're doing this controlled, right? People did before didn't want it openly. So now they're pushing a control one. We can't control it. And Chief Justice is saying, no, you can't control it. But he tells her, he says, you know, these professors, quote unquote, have approached me and they showed me this constitution. And I don't really understand what they're doing, but I don't like it. And what they're, one of the things they propose is they're going to abolish the states and set up regional uh, federal regions. So again, it's a Tugwell, right? As late as 88, they're still pushing that Tugwell uh, constitution. In the 90s, they came back. Now, in the 80s as well, the Rockefeller Foundation got involved and was funding NGOs to promote this, right? So now we have the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation involved. 1990s, they're pushing for the first time they start using the Convention of States. And the organization that, that was doing this was a, a, a liberal or an organization that catered to Democrats and liberals, okay? Versus Alley. Alley catered to, quote unquote, conservatives and Republicans. So, but, but, the, the liberal organization promotes the Convention of States and Alley endorses it. Right? What's that tell you? 
Uh, and again, they're pushing the balance by doing it. So now we come up to today, and we have this again the convention of state stuff. But then they're but they're pushing this stuff about very hardly about how the states are going to control it. That's the misconception they want, the misconception that they want everybody to believe. The states are going to control this, right? Um, and again, balanced budget is one of the amendments they're pushing. But now they have a flavor for everybody. Whatever your sweet tooth is, they've got it. Term limits, judicial limits, whatever. It's all right there. Um, Okay. Richard, do you have a, a, a source for that? Did you just went through that history? What, what's the best source to get? No, I made this up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some people do make stuff up. Right? Um, I do. The one, one thing that you can go to, you want to go to our website, defendnotaman.com. Okay. Uh, and there are articles. Now, this, I don't know if this, this is a, a uh, a summary, and I can provide this if you give me your email, I can kind of give you this. But there's an article called The Ford Foundation's Pursuit of Globalism on, on, on your website? website? Yeah. And it has more sites than you'll want. Okay. <laughs> That's where I'll go. Yeah, the current governor, he just fell right lockstep with the Roundless program. It's just oh, yeah. continuation. We got a full blown communism. We gotta get we gotta get mad. Well it started with Tom Dashall. Yeah. Well, actually Daniel. Okay, so now I wanna go and talk about Yeah. I wanna talk a little bit about um, really what's going on today. I'm trying to cut to the kind of the chase here and give you more of the meat. Richard, can you make sure that you talk about uh, Cato and Hannity. Yeah, that's where I'm going to go. Okay. I'm going to find my. Uh... Yeah, that's where I'm going to go. I apologize. I've got my misshuffled these. Okay. So one of the questions that we we had was, you know, we've tracked this from the 1950s through, you know, today. And notice their changes, and of course, whatever when, when they come out with something and it fails, then they say, "Okay, we fell on this issue or because of this." So they pull back, they wait about ten years, and then they come back out and they address that issue. Right? That's what they always do. The thing that's new this time around is we have Sean Hannity and Mark Levine and Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck are endorsing it. That's that's new. They've not done that kind of thing before, and. I mean, they've actually, you know, most of us understand that, that Sean Hannity was a neocon, right? He's not a real conservative, he's a neocon. But some of these others, like Rush Limbaugh, they pulled him out of the closet, right? I mean, they're serious this time. This is serious. This is the best planned, best funded, best organized attempt they've ever made in the last 50 years. And they're serious. And that's why they pulled these people out of the closet. They're controlled opposition, and that's why they're using them. And here's why, you know, here's why they're doing it. I was wondering about that. Why would these guys do it? And I get conservatives say, oh, Rush Limbaugh, he's Mark, Mark Levine. Okay. I did some research on that while you're looking there. I have been able to find where Limbaugh was actually coming out for it. I mean, it might be there, but I have been able to find it. And I found him. Well, I was going down the road this last fall when Levin's book came out and everybody was promoting it. He was kind of going, eh, you know, I, you know, I got to read it. And, and I was kind of a little bit you know, leery of that. But then I went back and I found some information on Levin. And I've got audio of him ripping the hell out of the, um, the Compact for America guys. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he was, he was a part of a panel. And they have audio of it, and that was just a couple of years ago, like 2010. And he sounded like you, and he sounded like the John Birch Society when he was up on that stage, and he was just tearing them apart, point by point by point. And now all of a sudden he breaks his book. What happened? He's going to tell you. Yeah, okay, well, I guess I just, I just set you up on the next. So it's got some zeros behind it. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I want to, what I'm going to talk about now is some organizations that are behind this movement, okay? And we're you know, we'll go down the path together. Um, there's an organization, a non-governmental non organization called the State Policy Network. Uh, and it's a hub organization, and by that I mean that other NGOs come together in that organization to coordinate their efforts, okay? So that's why I call it a hub organization. The State Policy Network is funded by the Charles Koch Foundation and Castle Rock Foundation. That's Adolph Kerr's folks, Castle Rock. Their members are the Heritage Foundation, who supports an Article 5. Heritage is funded by Charles Koch Foundation, Castle Rock Foundation, and Adolph Kerr's Foundation. Freedom, uh, Freedom Works is a member of this organization. It's promoting an Article 5 convention. It's, it's funded by a couple other foundations that, that aren't connected to the ones I just talked about, but we're still digging. This is preliminary stuff. This is, this is valid information, but we haven't, we're, going, we're digging deeper, all right? <clears throat> the Cato Institute is a member of the organization. They're promoting an, uh, an Article 5 convention. They're funded by the Open Society Foundations. Anybody know who funds those oh, folks? Yeah. Soros. George Soros, right? Okay. Uh, so this is interesting, isn't it? Because now we have this liberal organization that s supports the Convention of States, and then we have the ALEC, the conservative legislative organization that endorses it, and now we have these conservative organizations belong to this, and now we have Cato, who's under the control of George Soros. Wow. It's like they're working together on this. Independent Institute supporting a Article 5 convention. That's where uh, Robert Nadelson you guys are familiar with Robert Nadelson. The, uh, uh, Mark Levine based his book mostly on the work of Nadelson. He's at the Independence Institute. Independence Institute is funded by Charles Koch Foundation and Castle Rock Foundation. The Goldwater Institute is promoting an Article 5 convention. It's funded by the Charles Koch Foundation and the Walton Family Foundation. And then the Open Society Foundation is a member of this foundation. Of course, that's George Soros. And then Americans for Limited Government, and there's they're funded by American Encore Funding. Um, another sponsor, not a member, but a sponsor of the State Policy Network is the American Legislative Council, right? Remember we talked about that one, right? And it supports an Article 5 convention. Guess who funds Allen? Come on, together. Sure. Charles, Charles, Coke. Charles Coke Foundation oh, and Castle Rock Foundation. Right? So there you go. <laughs> Charles Coke is either Part of the Koch brothers? Yep. They yeah, they're funding them. everything, both sides. Now, Mark Levine, let's see. Mark Levine, since it, it may be 208, 209, somewhere in that line, uh, started getting funds, his production company, not him personally, but his production company, from the Americans for Prosperity. The co founder uh, of that is. Richard A. Fink, who's the executive vice president of Coke Industries, owned by Charles Coke. Um, David H. Coke personally funds Americans for Prosperity, right? They also get funded through Americans for Prosperity Foundation, and the chairman of that organization is David H. Coke. Freedom Works also funds Americans for Prosperity, and a member of that organization is Richard H. Fink, the executive vice president of industries. Freedom Partners also supports the Tea Party Patriots and they support an Article 5 convention. Right? Do you see what's going on? Uh, and also Freedom Partners, besides funding or paying Tea Party Patriots, they also fund the U.S. Chamber of Commerce who supports open borders, common core, and sustainable development. One of the most un-American organizations we have. So there's Mark Levine, the madman. Okay, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity both are supporting now the Article 5 convention, and they are partially funded to the tunes of a few million dollars. The Heritage Foundation that supports an Article 5 convention. The Heritage Foundation is funded by Charles Koch Foundation, Castle Rock Foundation, and Adolph Kerr's Foundation. Uh, and then, of course, Heritage is a member of the State Policy Network. Koch Foundation, Castle Rock Foundation, and then, of course, American Legislative Council is associated with them. Why are they doing this? Why do you think they're doing this? 
Is this, see, they want to say it's a grassroots organization. I, I have not found, you know, I, I've been doing seminars, you know, in Kansas talking about this. I have not found one person, not one, that has called one of his legislators and said, please initiate the process to change my constitution. Right. Not one. Who's doing it? Alec's doing it. Alec has like 3,200 state legislators. Alec is what I call a captive lobbyist organization, right? And what they do is they get around the lobbying laws because they let these legislators join for nothing, next to nothing, and then the big corporations come in and spend thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, to join and then to be on certain committees, and then their lobbyist attorneys, we should kill all the attorneys by the way, they're responsible for everything. <laughs> Aren't you one? Yeah. How would you How would you like that? I'm trying, I'm trying to make friends here. Uh, but these lobbyists come in there and give them this model legislation and then tell them, you know, you need to go home and file this and, you know, tell everybody it's you that's doing it, all right? That's what, that's what they do. Now, in Kansas, our Senate president is an executive director of Valley, right? And our Speaker of the House is an executive director of Valley. Wow, you know, sweet deal. Yeah, that's surprising how many NGOs are actually out there. Yeah, and if you start tracking them, I mean, the the United Nations and its lackeys that support sustainable development um, are tremendous at using NGOs to cover their tracks. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's an, it's amazing. You know, one of the things they, these folks want to tell you is they want a limited convention. And they'll say, some of them say they want a limited topic, limited uh, uh, subject, you know, on and on and on. Here's one that was filed. This is a, an Article 5 request from South Carolina filed this year. You wiped out everybody that, I mean, there is yeah. no conservative movement in, in the United States. No. It, I mean, I can see like the Wall Street Journal, to me they're with the New York Times, but I always always had faith in people like Jim DeMint and the Heritage Foundation. And now you're just not <laughs> no, things right we're up. Being, we're you? being majorly manipulated yeah. and have been since, since the beginning of the, the 1900s. How, do you, how are you going to have a movement if you don't have any spokespeople left? <laughs> Your you, that's what I was going to say. You sound um, great. <laughs> you know, I used to go to these meetings. I, had, I started a group in Kansas called the November Patriots. I wasn't a Republican, I wasn't a Democrat. I was a November Patriot. I voted for my country. I don't care if you have an R or D. You know. To me, that's immoral. You know, and these Republicans now, they have what they call no-fault Republicans. It's like Brownback. He lied to everybody, but that's okay. Because he's Republican, he's conservative, right? And he, but he's lying and taking money and doing all this nonsense. No fault. Doesn't matter. You still have to vote. Lesser are two evils. I, and I've looked and looked in my Bible, and nowhere in the Bible does it say, Thou shalt pick the lesser of two evils. It doesn't say that. That's the end of the man. Yeah, it's in Leviticus. Yeah, it's in Leviticus. <laughs> All right, I want to... Do you need another one? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what this is doing. Uh, all right, here's, here's their resolution for an article 5. It says, uh, this is for the sole purpose of, and they're, they're calling the convention, uh, to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for its officers and members of Congress. Now, if you're going to impose fiscal restraints, what that's talking about basically is Article 1, right? Article 1, primarily Section 8, I would suppose. Limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. What does the Constitution do? It limits the power of the federal government. It's supposed to. <laughs> so, Articles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 doesn't count, right? Because that's the article they ratify our current constitution by, rather than using the, the Articles of Confederation ratification provision, right? So it doesn't matter. So don't worry about that. That's okay. We won't mess with that. 
But everything else is up for grabs, right? Now, and this language, you know, this isn't just nutty South Carolina people, you know, like, like Graham. You know, a lot of, there's some nutty people in South Carolina. Uh, that language comes exactly out of the Convention of States handbook for legislators and citizens. That's the exact language they use in their model, right? So they, what they want, what they want is a unlimited, limited convention. All right, that's political double speak. You want an unlimited, limited convention. Here's one that was filed for an article, Article Five. This is in 2012, filed in uh, by Hawaii. You know, the, the deal is that. And in fact, our Secretary of State, who's supposed to be a, a conservative, he was in the Bush administration in the Attorney General's office uh, by the name of Chris Kobach. Do you know Chris Kobach? Um, he was, he did, he's promoting this heavily in Kansas. I mean, he's a celebrity. He's like Mark Levine in a way. He's a politician, but he's a celebrity in Kansas. And they're just, they're following him along. He's a Pied Piper. And he said, and I got this on video. He said just a couple of weeks ago, he said, it, it, you know what's so interesting? <laughs> the liberals aren't paying attention to this. They don't oh. even know what's going on. Oh. They don't? Well, George Soros knows. Anyway, so here's Hawaii. You don't have to worry about liberals and all those people getting involved. The first one is they want to repeal or modify the Second Amendment to the strength of federal restrictions. The repeal or modification oh. of the Second Amendment. Okay. Oh, That's a conservative oh, platform. Man. And they want a declaration of the constitutionality of the Federal Patient Protection Affordability Care Act. So they want to constitutionalize Obamacare, make health care right. They want an amendment abol abolishing the Electoral College. So they're, in essence, do what they did to the Senate, right? Um, they might as well throw in free spam and fantasy. So does everybody feel comfortable about what's going on? No. It's sad. Yeah. Now, and here's the other thing. This is this is the safeguards. They're talking about all the safeguards. One of them is Congress, right? If things go wacky, Congress is going to do something about it. Right? But of course, now they don't trust Congress, and you can't trust Congress, and they're going to restrict Congress in this convention. Because Congress won't limit its own rights, its own power. But if nothing goes wrong, they'll be there to help. All right. Then they say the Supreme Court is going to help. Something goes wrong, Supreme Court will help. So, number one, the Supreme Court may not be able to help because of a, a doctrine called a political question. They may not be able to. But are, are we going to trust them when, what did you say? When they okay to Obamacare. When we have a conservative... Supreme Court justice that tells us a penalty is a tax. Yeah. We're going to yeah. trust them to help us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then they say the states, you know, three quarters of the states have to ratify it, so we don't have to worry about that. Right? <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of the 16th, 17th, and 18th Amendments? All right? Mm -hmm. Just, what, what did the 17th Amendment do? Took away the, uh, or actually it made it so that the states could no longer, the state legislatures no longer elected the senators and they brought it back to the people. Yeah, so what, what was going on was the states had a representative in the central government and the people had a representative in the central government. Somebody proposed that this representative for the states be taken out and the states approved it. Would you do that? That's what they did. So, no, we're not worried, they're not going to do anything stupid. Right. Well, the states are also passing laws. One session, it'd be in, they're in their 40 days, which is each day is a session. They pass 421 laws, and pretty soon dairy people were out of business. Raw milk was put out of business. If you if you have a building and you have a tractor in it, that's just um, single purpose, but if you put cows in the other end, now that's dual poop purpose, and now your tax different. Well, and just like we've already talked about, uh, you know, the, 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 what they're trying to tell you is the states, the states are going to be our savior. They're going to get involved in this, and they're going to be our savior in all this. Well, who's who's been pimping out our liberties to the federal government for a hundred years? The states have. Yes. Who's been taking federal dollars? The states have. Yes. Do you think they're going to? Do you think they're going to want to cut? 
their access to federal dollars? No, on that 17th Amendment, though, they gave they they advocated their right to representing representative in the central government because the the senators who were their representatives in the government are now elected by we the people, mm -hmm. and they're completely unaccountable. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, you can't call them back on the carpet before the state legislature. Yeah, anymore. so in the, the Convention of States people, what they're telling you is, we got to get state sovereignty back. we got to get it back. Well, the states gave it away. Right. All right, I agree with it. We need to, I would like to repeal the 17th Amendment, but not by a convention, right? Well, with that said, why not get rid of the Electoral College and also apply term limits onto legislative branch? Like how the president can only serve eight years, he's done. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get into electoral college thing, but it it, it's, it messes with the principles of federalism. It, it it takes away, you know, it gives the bigger states too much. You know, it, it just it's punky deal, and I you know I don't want to get into. Well, that. I mean, to me, it kind of catches it up with the times because the whole purpose of the electoral college was back in those days when the constitution was written. They didn't have the type of technology we have today where we can watch who's running for president and vote. It was more of a, we're going to elect Bill here to go out there and yeah. represent us to go vote for the president. I think it's a bad idea. Right? If you look at, the, look at county by county across the whole United States, you know, there's a lot more conservative counties by thousands than yeah. there is unconservative, but they still end up with more votes because of the concentration of the populace. And so the electoral the college the spreads that out a little better so we have a little fair shake. That's why it was designed. Well, yeah, because then you could have California have a lot of votes. And they would elect the president every time. Well, basically, here's what they're, here's what they're proposing that we do. Here's, here's the way things are supposed to be. You have the people here ready to jump on the scale. We have the central and the states are balanced. Here's where we are now, right? The, the central government's really, you know, taking advantage of everything, right? So here's what they propose to do. This is really what they're proposing to do. <coughs> they want to trim the scale, all right? Does that solve the problem? Is that how it got? Is it, you know, no, that's what they want to do. They want to change the constitution. They want to change the scale. It makes no sense to do that. We're the ones that need to do our job. That's the bottom line. What what I've been proposing is, I say that, you know, the the founders wanted the states and the people working together to control the central government. That's the way it was set up. It worked that way for a long time. Forty yeah. minutes, Richard. Okay. Um, Or was it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 40-minute warning. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the problem is we're, we're not holding our state people accountable. We're in federal. But the bottom line, we the people are not going to get the central government under control. We can't do it. We, there's just no way. We've got to do like the founders. We've got to get the state governments under control, get them working together, get the, the central government under control. The way to do that is to empower the people to hold our elected officials accountable. And so I say we change the state amendments, our, our constitutions, to give the power of recall to the people. So when they lie to us, or they, they bre breach their oath, you pull their butts out. I mean, we have a senator, uh, or a congressman, Congresswoman Len Jenkins, that uh, when they were doing the, the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, I, or, is anybody familiar with that? Okay, so what it did was it declared war on the American people, and I'm serious about that, and it gutted half of the Bill of Rights. I'm serious. It's a, it's a, it's a serious, serious deal. She joined in some other congresspersons and wrote a letter to the conference committee, the committee that balances both bills, the House and Senate, together. And they said, the citizen detention provisions are unconstitutional. You need to take them out. Right? They, she wrote them a letter. And they didn't take them out. But she voted for it. Right? She voted for it. So we caught her at a tea party meeting and said, did you do that? And of course she said, oh, well, no, well, you're trying to lie about it. So, but we, you know, we got her in a corner and she says, well, yeah, I knew there was a problem, but I just was thinking that maybe the Supreme Court would take care of it. 
Oh, right. She should be recalled. There should be a mechanism to get rid of somebody because she violated her oath. Right. So that's on the federal level. Or the and so did Christy Noem and all of all of the South Dakota people did. They all voted for it. Yeah. yeah. But we need to get we need to empower the people to have referendum to pull bills out to introduce our own bills and change the constitution if we need to. You know, that's what we got to do. We we've, we've got to be responsible because we can. We can get control of the states. I can drive to my capital, and I can follow them around the state, and I have. Uh, but I can't do that with the Fed folks, right? So that's what we need to do. That's what I suggest. We don't need to do this nonsense, because this is this is cutting off our nose to spite our face. No, we're having, I don't think the button has a little not has a beard on there. They just, they just leave Well, them. here's one thing that, here's one thing that, that that I tell you, um, you know, there's too many of them. You can't, you can't watch them all. You can't track them all down, right? I mean, you just you can't. So, what you do, you know, and I got this from watching uh, Animal Planet. Have you ever seen a pride of, of lions hunting the, the wildebeest? There's yeah. like millions of wildebeest, right? And there's four or five little lions. And all of a sudden, they grab one of them, and it's a bloody screaming mess. And these millions of wildebeest take off, right? The lions can't possibly get all these wildebeest. Mm. But what happens? They think, I don't want to be that one. <laughs> so if you find a bad politician, and you get him. And you don't let up until he goes down. And then the rest of them think, ooh, I don't want to be that one. Why am I writing their ass all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess one no, I, that's what I I followed them around the state. Every yeah. time they popped up at a tea meeting or a town hall meeting, I was right there asking the questions. I well, they would stop. They wouldn't. They wouldn't call on me, right? They, eventually, right? So, you know, like one time, I, I went in with a, a friend of mine, a nice young little lady, and she's sitting in the second row, and I'm over here, and I'm doing this, and the lieutenant governor's ignoring me, and he goes, "How about you, my friend? Oh, you think I'm bad?" You come up and you know, that's what you got to do. You know, you, you plan it and you go after them. All right, so say, say we do get control back of the states, what's going to prevent this from happening again? Like, nothing. Us. Yeah. All of us. But, but that, that's not, again. I'm going to tell you just from my generation, that's never going to happen. My generation is too concerned with who Kim Kardashian's hanging out with and who's running for, for president or. Congress, like when I ran for, for city council in Southern California, the only thing I could do to get people that are my age to get out and vote was to show them, go to their homes personally and show them how to do a mail-in ballot. That was the only way. And then even then, the only reason why they voted for me was because they knew me. Most of them didn't vote for anyone else, so they didn't care. Well, you know, but but, what, what I call it, I, did, I, gave a, I gave a presentation, and at the end of the presentation, the gentleman stands up and he says, well, Mr. Fry, I think what you're truly trying to tell us all is these politicians are not following their oath to protect the Constitution. Well, who, who's going who's to make them do that? And I said, well, we are. And he says, well, we're not going to do that. People will never do that. And I said, you know what? That's a Jesus on the cross moment. All right? yeah. Jesus yeah. on the cross moment. Yeah. When Jesus was on the cross, he had one guy that mocked him. And he had another guy that acknowledged him and asked his forgiveness. And you're asking me, well, Mr. Fry, what's going to happen to the guy that mocked Jesus? He's going to hell. If we don't acknowledge our responsibility and do our moral duty, we're going to hell with the Republic. That's it. There is no other way. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, there's no magic about it. I'm not here to bring good news, just the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you need to go to Kansas and drive around. <laughs> I appreciate this information because we're being told that the South Dakota government is more corrupt than that of Illinois. Wow, that would be hard to believe. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is true. It's true. Oh, but, but we man. sound good. Hey, you caught me on that. If you go, if you go to uh, if you go to the uh, 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 should be talking uh, for the yeah, We're ranked 49th for corruption. We're, we're almost the best at something. <laughs> we're going to have well, state uh, commander about it when we get to first place. But, but again, look, you got to get to the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is that we're ignorant, right? We're ignorant and we're lazy. 
and I'm listen. I'm not. I'm not being pious uh, with what I'm doing. I'm I'm trying to redeem myself for sitting on my butt for 40 years and not doing anything. Right? I'm not a good guy, and I deserve what I get. Right? We all we all deserve what we get because we're sitting on our butts. But my son doesn't deserve it. He didn't do anything, and I'm not going to leave him that mess. I'm not. 